I'm done. Welcome to Galveston Unscripted. We are headed out to the jetties. We got Captain Garrett back there on the SS Unscripted. Well, if you want to stand right here, Thank you to our sponsor, Texas' oldest newspaper, The Daily News, bringing you the news since 1842. Go out and support your local newspaper, The Daily News. Captain Garrett and I are headed to the entrance to the Galveston, Houston, and Texas City Ship Channel, where we will be exploring the jetties that reach miles into the Gulf of Mexico, some of the largest breakwaters in the world. Now to enjoy the nice calm ride from the causeway out to the entrance to the ship channel. Why are we going to explore the history of these jetties? Because without this 19th century project, the three major ports it serves today would not be nearly as successful. And they were only constructed because Galveston seized an opportunity to become the premier port in Texas and the Gulf Coast. Okay, on our journey from the bay side, we go under the Pelican Island Bridge. We are headed to the ship channel to the jetties. First, let's talk about why these jetties are here and so important in the first place. After the Civil War ended in 1865, the American West and Midwest were growing. Farms were producing crops like cotton and vegetables as fast as they could to be shipped out to other countries and even the northeastern United States. The problem for places like Kansas and the New Mexico, Colorado, and Nebraska territories is that they were nowhere near a deepwater port like New Orleans or Pensacola. Galveston was a port primed to explode economically if the port and entrance to the ship channel were deeper. After a relatively rough ride from the causeway through the port of Galveston, we arrive at the Galveston jetties. This one right here is the North Jetty. These jetties were built to prevent silting and sandbars from building up along the entrance to Galveston Bay and the ship channel. If you've ever been in a boat or looked at an aerial map or gone on a cruise or anything, you may have noticed these long rock formations extending all the way out into the Gulf of Mexico, extending all the way from the baller. This is why it's unscripted. The North Jetty here is extending all the way from the Bolivar Peninsula, which is right back there. And the South Jetty extends from the extreme east end of Galveston Island into the Gulf of Mexico. So here's a good example of why these jetties were built. If you look over that way, you can see how shallow that water is where all those waves are. But where we are right here inside of the jetty, inside the mouth of the channel, how deep is it, Garrett? Right now we're sitting at 43 feet. Right out here it was 54 feet. In the 1860s and 70s, some of the deepest parts to the entrance to the ship channel were only around 14 and a half feet, meaning only shallow draft vessels could enter the port of Galveston. You may be asking, what is a draft? A vessel's draft is how deep the bottom of the vessel is in the water. The Texas coastline is very shallow and sandy. Galveston had the problem of sandbars and silt building up at the entrance to the ship channel before any jetties to stop silting were built. Vessels would often get caught on sandbars and have to find creative ways to remove themselves Galveston was able to serve deepwater vessels, however, it was done using a laborious and expensive method called lightering, where smaller vessels with shallow draft would load cargo at the port and take that cargo to larger, deeper draft vessels offshore. City officials were desperate to improve this problem and sought ways to deepen the ship channel and keep it deep to allow the world's largest and deepest vessels to call the port of Galveston. In the mid-1800s, the port of Galveston was the major port in Galveston Bay. By the 1890s, the Port of Texas City and Houston were mere startups, piggybacking off of Galveston's success and infrastructure investment. In the early 1870s, Galveston city leaders and businessmen petitioned the federal government for funds to build a set of jetties to prevent silting that would allow deep draft vessels directly into the deep water of the Port of Galveston, which was naturally 25 to 30 feet deep. Funding was not immediately allocated for the Port of Galveston. So Galvestonians decided to start a jetty project for themselves, as they knew this would give them a huge advantage over competing Texas ports, as well as a huge boost for the Galveston economy. The crops and goods in the West needed a more efficient outlet, and Galvestonians were determined to maintain their status as the major port on the Texas coast. Galveston began their jetty project in 1873, and by the 1890s, the United States government allocated funds to extend the jetties to the current lengths that we see today. 
When they built these jetties, they brought most of the granite rock in from Central Texas, near modern day Marble Falls. Tens of thousands of granite rocks were cut and brought from a quarry, brought down to Galveston on a rail car, and then a train trestle was built out over the entire length of the jetty in order to get the material out to these locations, miles away from land. The jetties were also home to lighthouses in order to guide vessels into the port of Galveston. And as you can see, during rough weather and even just a windy day, you have pretty intense waves over there on the other side of the jetty. Fight that way. I'm done. We're done with the drone. Dude. I'm not crashing this. Dude, that was impressive. Yeah. I, I'm putting this away. That was good. You got a pretty good shot though. Oh yeah, I damaged the prop. In the 1890s, when these jetties were completed, along with an extensive dredging project where they deepen and widen the ship channel, the goal of preventing silting and sandbars at the entrance to the ship channel was realized. Not only opening up access to the port of Galveston for deep draft vessels, but to the port of Texas City and Houston. When these jetties were completed, they also drew fishermen from around the country. They were some of the longest jetties and breakwaters in the world. Here we are at the entrance to Galveston Bay. If you've ever ridden the Bolivar Ferry towards Bolivar, and you look out to your port side or left, you will see SS Selma. Selma was built in 1919. She's made almost entirely of concrete and rebar. What's interesting about these concrete ships is that Galveston isn't just home to one of them. There are actually two. One of them lives at the North Jetty. The Durham, like the Selma, was a World War I era concrete ship used mainly as an oil tanker. The Durham was brought to Galveston in 1935 to be an oil reservoir on Pelican Island. But by 1936, the Durham was acquired by a businessman. The Durham was moved a few miles offshore of Galveston and transformed into a fishing pier and resort, where fishermen could go spend the day fishing off of the Durham. The Durham was closed down a few years later, probably due to damage from a hurricane. And by the 1960s, she was placed at the east side of the tip of the North Jetty. Around 1963, the Durham broke into two pieces. But one of the largest pieces of the Durham can still be seen at the tip of the North Jetty. And lots of fishermen fish around this vessel to this day. Okay, look, I hope you enjoyed this brief overview of the Galveston jetties. Captain Garrett and I had an absolute blast riding out to the jetties and checking them out. I think it's safe to say that without the expansion of the United States and Galvestonian ingenuity and starting a jetty project in the mid-1800s, the port of Galveston, Texas City, and Houston would not be what they are today. Competitive ports that bolster our economy. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to share it, like it, and follow us on all social media. We are everywhere. And we'll see you next time on Galveston Unscripted.